the future drawing detail sessions will be, will be a bit longer. All right. This is all being recorded, so as long as the, the computer doesn't explode with all these devices, this is being recorded, so you don't need to worry too much about um, taking lots of notes. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to um, go in and interrogate, we'll probably just really manage one of, the, one of the specific details, and what I thought we'd look at is this sort of relationship up here where this the roof meets the glass, the glass meets the wall. Okay, so let's just get straight in to looking at that. And what I'm going to do this session, um, sorry, let's get my settings right. This session I'll just do all the drawing, but in future sessions, um, if you're willing, I'd like to invite um, some of you up to, uh, to contribute and have a go. Okay, let's just get that working. Okay, so I'm, I'm cheating slightly as well because I've got some of the details here. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not showing you those. Okay. Last, last year I, I pretended that I was just making it up as I went along. <laughs> okay, right. So, so what I normally do with any kind of, whenever I'm doing any kind of detail, I normally like to start with structure, okay? So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start by drawing the structural member. Now, let's just get the scale right. I'm going to be drawing it 1 to 5. I, I typically detail it 1 to 5 and then maybe move up to 1 to 2. I don't normally bother with anything smaller than that by hand because it's too, it's too fiddly. So, at 1 to 5, I'm going to draw this as a 100 by about 150 timber member. Okay. And what you might notice is I'm using this, um, this Rodier dotted paper. Okay. <laughs> there. Which you can buy now from Reprographics. What's great is the dots, they help you to keep your lines perpendicular and square. And also, once you, get, once you get familiar with it, you start to get a familiarity with what the dots mean. So, for example, four dots. Four dots is 100 millimeters at one to five. <clears throat> okay, so it becomes a really useful tool when you're detailing. Okay. What I do notice is that the the project is just slightly squashing it here, so if I draw a square on the sheet of paper, it's probably going to look slightly squashed on there, but we'll just, we'll just continue anyway. So there's my, um, my, timber, my timber member, okay, and just looking at the detail that I'm basing it on here, that, that is not drawn as a, um, as a glue laminated member, it's actually drawn as a... Uh, conventional piece of timber. Okay. I've drawn a thick line around it just to indicate that it's structure, that I've chopped through it, and that just helps when you're, when you're building the drawing just to, um, to, to give you that kind of clarity between structure and non-structure. I'm going to move in and start to look at this, this window configuration. Now, what we've got here is that plasterboard ceiling which Peter was kind of referring to as this white white stuff it kind of has no materiality so it's just a plasterboard I'll just put a, a kind of dotted texture in that um, it's not really made of anything it's just plaster and then it's rendered and it's painted white and they kind of wanted it to disappear okay And then at the edge, what they've actually done is they've tapered back the plasterboard even further to, to, to get this effect where they were able to kind of hide the window frame. So what I'm drawing here is actually the outer piece of glazing. So this line where my pen is, is the outside of the building. Okay, so there's the, there's the outside of the building over there. And... They've created this kind of recess here by tapering it. 
to hold this this glass in place. Okay, so let's. What I'm going to do now is just get that glass in, because that will that will help us to kind of fix everything else. So here's our double glazed unit. Okay, that's our glass. And I'll draw, I'll leave a little gap there and just continue drawing um, because what I don't want to do is try and fit the entire sheet of glass on this page. It just wouldn't fit. Okay, so we'll just put a little break line in there. Sometimes you do a sort of like a jagged hash to indicate there's a break, but I'm just going to leave a little gap. Okay, so there's our glass. And the nature of the glass in this building is it doesn't it doesn't have a frame on it so it's actually adhesive bonded glass where they've got the two layers of glass and it's it's held together with an adhesive interlayer here fixing that in place okay so there's our glass and what we've, what they've actually done at the at the head and the sill of this glass is they've just held it in place with these stainless steel angles. So it's not, it, it kind of appears like it's not even a, a kind of proprietary glazing system, but they've, it would appear that they've actually kind of designed it themselves. So what they've got is an angle here, a stainless steel angle at the top here, and then there's a slightly smaller one at the back, and like this, which is then clamping that. There's a probably a sort of neoprene packer in here. Which is um which is then sort of holding that glass in place. And then the whole arrangement, I'll use a slightly thicker pen for this, is held back to a more substantial piece of steel. Which is, which must also be stainless, actually, because it's sat, it is actually sat out in the rain, which you'll see in a moment. Okay. So it's that's all fixed back to this more substantial member, and what they've what they've actually got here is some countersunk um, fittings. So you have what, what people call self-tapping, self-tapping screws, self-tapping fixings, which, which means that you can, the sort of nature of the screw, it will cut into the metal and, and drill it, make its own hole. So I suspect that's what they've done because they probably didn't want to have a, a sort of bolt head on the top here because that bit there, as you'll see in a minute, is actually sat in the rain. So I guess they didn't want that. So they've it looks like, looking at the details here, they've used a sort of self-tapping screw and the person who's fixing it has just stopped before they punctured through the top of that, that angle. Okay. And what I like about the detailing of this, this building is it, it is all just kind of bits put together. You know, it's just how you might think. If you were sat thinking, how do we hold that in place? Get lots of bits of angle and bolt them together and, and that's kind of what it is. Um, Okay, so we've now got that held, kind of held in place, but this, um, this steel angle is not fixed to anything. And what they appear to have is another timber member here. Like this. Okay. Yeah. Which again, we, we use, I'm going to use this... Um, Sim this crosshatch symbol to indicate that it's just a piece of sawn timber. Okay, it's not, it's not necessarily a piece of hardwood, it's not a piece of oak. If you're using hardwood, you tend to put a, the sort of wood grain effect to indicate it's hardwood. But, but all of this could just be kind of constructional joinery cut, cut to shape on site. Okay, and then what we appear to have is, I'll draw that with a thicker line, is a roofing board, which I would have guessed is plywood, but 
I mean, actually looking at the kind of detail I've got, it's not entirely clear. But I'm going to draw that as a, as a kind of thick sheet of, sheet of plywood, or maybe it's maybe even two layers of plywood, because I've, I've drawn that about 50 mil thick. So, so what I'm assuming is that they've got two layers of 24 millimeter plywood laid across the roof to give it to give you a deck, okay, to give you something substantial. And I tend to draw plywood with a um, ooh, a bit wobbly, but with some sort of parallel thinner lines inside, which just gives you that feeling of the um, the plywood layers. I'm, I'm rushing that a bit. You notice I'm not using a ruler um, for any of this. I just find it quicker generally to do it by hand. Um, the other thing if you find when you're drawing by hand, see everything I'm drawing is a bit, it's all a bit wobbly, but it doesn't really matter. Whereas when you start drawing things with a ruler and it's all kind of neat and then you draw something a bit wobbly, it looks, it looks kind of wrong. So I prefer for rapid, you know, rapid detailing, just kind of, just let it wobble a bit. Okay, you know, as long as you draw it big enough, it, it kind of communicates. Um, you might also notice some, I generally leave gaps between things. Because in, in reality, on a, on a building site, things are brought together and they join. So rather than sort of using one black line um, as a shortcut, I tend to just draw things twice and just, just leave that little gap to indicate that these parts have been brought together. Sometimes if you draw just the one line, it, it, it kind of looks like things are, are kind of stuck together or welded together. So that's, you know, that's the way I prefer to, um, to do it. Okay, so we've got this deck, and I've made a mistake there. Okay, that should be, this plywood deck should go all the way along. Okay, and that's the beauty of your Tipex pen. Oh, there we are, I've got a bit coming out. Yeah. I, I, I like to use Tipex pens because it's just quick, okay, <laughs> when you've got one. Um, if you're drawing on tracing paper, you can, you can get your, skull, your um, razor blade out and start scratching off, but you then have to repair the surface with a rubber because otherwise it will bleed. And you know, for this kind of rapid drawing, just, just throw a bit of Tipex on, generally. It works. You have to let it dry. Um, I mean, also, I haven't really got time today, but... Maybe in the next session we'll talk about tracing paper versus dotted paper, all right? The dotted paper is not translucent. Tracing paper has certain benefits. The tracing paper has a nice texture as well. But, all right, so there's that. And what they've got, they've then got a whacking great chunk, chunk of timber here. which is, I guess, is drawn, dr sorry, is, is sawn on site, and it would appear that, that this actually is a chunk of, big substantial chunk of hardwood, okay, probably because it's so big that they, you couldn't manage to buy a piece of softwood, I'm not sure. Um, and what they're doing is they're using that to create a fillet for the waterproofing, which we'll, we'll draw in a moment. Um, typically not bothering to draw, <coughs> excuse me, not bothering to draw all the screws, fixing plywood together, plywood to timber. You know, this is, I'm sure this has got some screw fixings on nails, fixing this all together, but tend not to bother drawing it because you know that the joiners on site will understand that. Your engineer would be giving them some, some if it's structural, giving them some information. If you did want to draw it, um, what I tend to do is just draw a sort of dotted line like that. It's not... Unless it's really visible fixing, it's not worth drawing the screw head and drawing the, thru, the, um, the recess, the countersunk hole. If it was something that you really wanted to see, then you might start drawing that countersunk hole for the screw to tell the joiners on site that's how you want it finished. But for normal uh, kind of builder's work, just a dotted line will, will do the trick. Okay, I think my tipex is just about there. Finish that one. If you draw in your tipex before it's ready, you um, you wreck your pen. 
Okay, you know, it's not, also, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm just using these fairly cheap pens, you know. I'm not, I'm not using rotrings. Okay, they, they're just, they're quick. You can, you know, you can draw quickly with them. You can throw them away if you damage them. You don't want to be using like a rotary repeatograph where it's six pounds for a nib or, or whatever and you're too worried about breaking the thing. Okay. All right, I'll go through Tipex now. There we are. So we've got that. And what they've done on this building is it's a single ply roofing membrane. So it's like a little thin sheet of plastic. Okay. It's not my favorite roofing material. Um, it, the, the, it's prone to leaking because if, if anybody stands on it on site you put a little hole through it you won't know until the rain starts coming through it okay and in in practice we did a piece of research where we we researched 20 roofing types and we found that the single plies were performing the worst now the the, the favoured um, roofing type that, that it that we were using at BDP, so that's very small, is a product called Derbigum, which is actually a kind of hot melt system where you get sheets of, of, of asphalt material and you, you stick it together with hot melted asphalt. Um, the great benefit of that is that it's self-sealing. So if somebody punctures it, if you put a nail through it, it will actually close up the hole afterwards. It's a much more robust and, you know, I would say a more sustainable product because this will give you a roof that hopefully will last for 50 years without leaking. Whereas a, a single ply membrane, you know, you might, get, you might get 10 years out of it. Or in fact, what we found in our research at BDP was most of those roofs were leaking before we'd even got into the building. Okay, so you can just Google Derbigum. Um, there are other products out there, but it's a... If you are, do end up in your project doing a, a single ply roof that nobody will ever see, because they're pretty ugly, all of these, no one's walking on it, it's just a flat roof out of the way, Derbigum's a good, a good option. Okay, so what they've then got is their roofing membrane. Um, laid over the top. Okay, and I'm I'm giving it a bit of thickness because, don't, you know, don't don't draw these building materials like they're made of um, tissue paper. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, they normally they have a bit of a thickness. They're not they're not wafer thin. Okay, um, I've probably drawn that too thick actually, but anyway, I'll just put a dotted. I'll just put a dotted line through the middle of it just to indicate that it's a. It's a waterproof roofing membrane. Okay. So we've, they've got that laid out. That's keeping the water off. Obviously, on this building, they don't want any gutters because they don't see expressed gutters. So what they're doing is the water drains back into the middle of the roof and then they have um, rainwater outlets in the sort of in the, in the middle of the roof to drain that away into internal pipes. Um, if we get time, I'll draw that, but we might, we might not have time. Okay. And to finish it here, what they've actually done is, well, I forgot to connect, but that, that steel angle there, which is holding the head of the glass, is, is bolted back into this timber. Okay. So that's that's kind of bolted back nice and strong, tighten it up. And what they've actually got here is a flashing which I assume is a stainless a bent piece of stainless steel. Could be it could be aluminium, I'm not sure. And they, they're flashing that over that over that bolt head to protect it, and then just to give it a little bit of rigidity at the bottom, it's kind of belt, bent back on itself like that, and that's screwed back in. And what they've done, although I don't think it's a particularly great 
detail. What they're showing on the drawing I've got, in fact, which I'm not going to draw because I don't like it, they're, they're just showing that roofing membrane lapped over the top like that. I'm not going to draw that. I think it would be much better to probably bring that, bring that roofing membrane over. Okay, kind of like this. And you, you don't want it flapping about in the wind, so maybe just put a small aluminium clamping piece on there just to hold that in, hold that in place. Okay, just zoomed in a bit there. And that's the, um, that is pretty much the eaves detail. I'm just looking to see if I've missed anything. That looks like it. So the water, the water will hit this roofing material, it will drain off, it will hit the stainless steel flashing, it will hit the stainless steel angle and it will drip, drip off. Okay. I think you'd have to be slightly careful here whether that, that water here would actually drip off because there's a danger there that the water doesn't drip off but it gets through surface tension it gets stuck onto that um, stainless steel angle and actually just gets sucked back onto the glass um, so it's slightly slightly risky that but probably okay okay and then we'll we'll just draw the condition at the bottom and then we're probably going to run out of time okay what you've got what I'm not drawing here is where the pen is now is inside here you've got this internal layer of glass so this is our sort of weatherproof layer that we've drawn but then they have that that milky internal layer so you can't see any of the kind of um, detail that's going on in here okay Um, there's a layer of insulation between the block work and the timber structure. Oh, you mean in the roof? Yeah. yeah, there is. Yeah, sorry, there is. Yeah, not a huge amount, actually, for, for Munich. I mean, this was built in 1991-92. But I'm quite surprised that they've... I guess it must be a very high-performance insulation, but they've got... Um, they filled that depth in there with insulation, which I guess is about 150 mil. So it wouldn't be enough if you if you're using a quilted insulation, but um, if you're using a, a, a sort of rigid um, high performance insulation, it's probably okay. Yeah, insulation there, and there's a little timber wedge here just to support that um, plasterboard. Okay, what you would, what you'd be advised to do, what would be a good, probably, policy here would be to put a vapour barrier underneath your plasterboard, above your plasterboard, sorry. Okay, I'll just talk a little bit about, we'll talk about vapour now. Um, People get a bit confused between sort of the different kind of vapor barriers and moisture barriers. So, just to talk about these very briefly, um, and we're not going to get we're not going to have time to, to draw this bottom detail, but I'll give you the um, the detail that I'm cheating from anyway. Okay. So, different membranes. You have a roofing membrane. Okay. Here. And that's kind of obvious, that's keeping the rain out, okay? So that doesn't let water through. Um, now, the blue dotted line I drew was a vapour barrier, and that's all about, it's about this, okay? It's about us breathing in buildings, and it's about that, that moisture, that vapour. What we don't want is for that vapour to get into our insulation, because then we run the risk that it reaches a cold point, the dew point, and it condenses and turns to water. And you end up with water in your insulation. Okay, so so that's the vapor barrier. Now the other the other kind of barrier, which I can't really draw 
here because it's a different roof construction, but if I very, very quickly draw a pitched roof, and I mean, I mean quickly, okay, tiled roof, um, some sort of roof structure, insulation, vapour barrier, here. So the, the other barrier that, that people get a bit confused with is a breathable, breathable membrane, which is this, or breather paper, but I'll call it a breathable membrane. Okay. So the difference is, again, the vapour barrier here is trying to um, is trying to keep the moisture in the air in the building, it's trying to stop it getting into the insulation. Okay, so it's a plastic layer that just stops that vapour getting through. Okay, the because this is a, a sort of tiled roof or a slate roof, we're not so worried about rain because we're getting rid of most of that. We're just a little bit worried about any rain that might get blown under the tiles or perhaps during the construction of the building. And that's where we put in a breathable membrane. So a sort of Tyvek. Tyvek is the, one of the common brand names. And that, that is like your Gore-Tex coat. Okay, so your Gore-Tex coat stops the rain getting through it, but it hopefully lets your sweat, your moisture, your vapor, sorry, to push through, okay, and that's why it's called breathable membrane. Um, difference is that the um, the vapor barrier, the blue dotted one here, won't let any moisture through it, any vapor. It's completely impermeable to to vapor. Okay, you mustn't get it in the wrong place. Um, I had a I had a um, a friend of mine who was refurbishing their their attic space, and they put the they, they got this all confused and they put the vapour barrier on the wrong side of the insulation, so they put it where my pen is. The problem there is they were making it worse because all that moisture in their breath would get into the insulation and then it would be trapped and wouldn't get any further. So it's got to be on the right, on the room side. Okay. Now the other alternative to a vapour barrier is as long as your materials are are more go from being more impermeable to less impermeable. So for example, if this here was plywood <coughs> on the inside, and if here on the outside we had say OSB or or maybe just a, a decking board or in fact it was open, you know, ideally if it was just, if it was just um, timber battens holding that roof, then because you've got this differential of, of, of permeability, the plywood should stop most of that vapour getting into that insulation. Any, any vapour which does manage to get through, the heat in the room should then push it through the construction and push it out the other side, okay? As long as that outer layer there is not more impermeable because that will just trap it okay um, and that's the kind of the kind of basic principle the difference between the different barriers okay I think it's a good one just to um, you know just to talk about now because students get a bit confused with it later on in their projects okay bit of a rush there but we'll we'll stop okay um, so th as I say this has all been videoed so so these um, these drawings that I've done live, will, you can, if you want to, you can, you can see them again. Um, and that will be the kind of format for the future case studies, that we'll, we'll have the case study, then we'll, we'll interrogate some of those details with a bit longer, normally. Okay, any questions? Great, thanks very much. Oh, thank you.